Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Virtual Cambridge Union. Today, we are having our panel on colonial artifacts with four distinguished and esteemed panelists, Dr. Monica Hanna, Chika Okekeagulu, Dan Hicks, and Felwyn Saar. On the question, should museums return their colonial artifacts? Is African heritage currently the prisoner of European museums? This panel of esteemed academics and museum curators will explore the pressing question of whether artifacts taken during the colonial era should be returned to their country of origins. This panel will bring a fresh international perspective on this contentious issue, which has been subsumed into the quote, culture wars, unquote, in the UK. Our institutions, whether they be Cambridge colleges or national museums, contained many important artifacts that were taken from countries under colonial rule. As institutions like the University of Aberdeen and nations like France up to return some looted artifacts, the time has come to question whether our government's continued dismissal of restitution is justified. Dr. Monica Hanna is an archaeologist and Egyptologist. Her research focuses on space, knowledge, and identity of archaeological sites, with particular interest on in different meanings and reflections of heritage on the identity of space and communities. She is the acting dean of the College of Archaeology and Cultural Heritage, Arab Academy for Science, Technology, and Maritime Transport in Aswan, Egypt. Chika Okeke Ndulu is an Igbo Nigerian artist, art historian, art curator, and blogger specializing in African and African diaspora art history, and the director of graduate studies in the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University over in the States. And Hicks is a British archaeologist and anthropologist. He is currently the professor of contemporary archaeology at the University of Oxford, creator of the Pitt Rivers Museum, and a fellow of St. Cross College, Oxford. Last but not least, Elwin Saar is a humanist, philosopher, economist, and a musician and the Anne-Marie Bryan Chair in French and Francophone Studies at Duke University over in the States. He is the author of Afrotopia. Monica, if you kick us off with um, your opening remarks, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Tara, for the introduction. Um, I'm very glad uh, to be part of this panel. Um, I would like to start by uh, reviewing a few ideas on uh, repatriation, particularly for Egyptian collections. Uh, most of the discourse that has been targeting the restitution of African heritage has always ignored Egypt, as if Egypt does not, uh, is not located in Africa. And this happens because a lot of the Western circles have culturally appropriated ancient Egypt. So as if ancient Egypt is part of, I mean, even Egyptology was being taught under classics for a very long time. So as if uh, Egypt is part of Europe uh, rather than belonging to Africa. So most of the discussions have, have ignored uh, Egypt and uh, the huge collections that many European museums uh, have. The second um, thing I would really like to uh, uh, start with today is that the problem is not just in the restitution of the objects. I can see that uh, many museums have started the discourse. I think the bigger problem is the restitution of the locus of control and the agency of knowledge production for the different African countries. Um, I'll just uh, give a, an example. In next year, the Grand Egyptian Museum is going to open, uh, showing the full collection of uh, Tutankhamun, which was discovered by Howard Carter in 1922. So it would be uh, 100 years post the discovery. However, the archive is not in Egypt. The archive of the excavation is in the UK, which means that the knowledge production uh, for the objects and putting them in the historical context and finding uh, relational information between the different artifacts will always remain in the hands of the West. So it's not just a restitution of the physical object. I think that uh, the argument is, is way a lot bigger. It's again about the restitution of the objects and giving African nations the agency to rewrite history from uh, a local perspective, uh, away from the white man perspective. Also many of these histories were written in a very uh, gendered uh, manner. And I think that we need to rewrite the history of these objects from the different perspectives of the African nations. Thanks so much, Monica. Uh, Chica? Thank you so much uh, for 
uh, the Cambridge Union for bringing us together today to uh, talk about what I think is one of the most important topics in uh, global contemporary culture today, which is really uh, the reckoning with the legacies of capitalist imperial um, era uh, on subject peoples uh, across the planet, not just Africa, but um, in Latin America, in Asia, Southeast Asia, um, and, and so forth. That as we, as, as we move away from that period, that there needs to be a rethinking of the legacies of colonialism, precisely because those legacies still deeply impact. Uh, the present and uh, quite possibly uh, our many futures. And so in thinking about museums, which as we very well know, were one of the most important institutions of colonization, uh, not just because they articulated the makings of European nationalisms, but also how they saw the rest of the world, right? And so if we are to then rethink the legacies of colonialism, museums sit at the very core of these debates, these conversations, and these acts of repair, uh, which is really is what is at the, at the basis of uh, restitution. And as Monica mentioned, it's not just about physical objects, which are important nevertheless, because if we leave that aside, then you find arguments about why can't we keep the physical objects and give you the virtual <laughs> uh, equivalencies of that in digital forms and 3D, 4D representations of the physical objects. So those are important, but the knowledge is that are associated, that have been accreted um, within these objects have to be re-examined. And this is part of how I understand Monica's very important comment about the location and status of archives that are associated with what museums have, with what museums keep. Because ultimately art is a form of knowledge production, right? And to the extent that we have to think about all the various elements that play into both the production, but also of art and of the knowledges around them, but how those knowledges are transmitted. And so if we're talking about uh, restitution, about return of cultural artifacts, it's not just about the object, it's how do we rethink knowledges that are uh, associated with these physical objects that are kept in museums today. That's really powerful. Dan? Of course, yes. And so I guess sort of in this uh, conversation, we also have to think about what can be done from the European, uh, you know, angle. So as a curator here in Oxford, I think, you know, you know I'm increasingly aware that the museum is being seen in a way that it hasn't been in recent years. And in part, that is because the colonial museum has failed. And when something fails, we see it. If you're on your way to work in the morning and the, uh, the car won't start, suddenly the car is there in a way that it wasn't on any other normal morning. And you open up the bonnet and you try to work out how do we fix this thing? And the thing that's, I think we're seeing, the reason we're seeing the museum in this way, the thing that has uh, failed is the enduring ideology that led to the formation of some aspects of what the European institutions were in terms of the museum, which was a sort of a cultural supremacy, uh, we, you know, which was, if you like, in anthropology and archaeology at the end of the 1880s, 1890s, you know, what those, those sort of fields were is incredibly, you know, different, you know, as compared with, you know, what they, they are now. 
So across Europe, we're seeing a reckoning with the legacies of empire in the form of institutional racisms and intellectual racisms. So what some are calling the de decolonization of the museum and what I prefer to see is the unfinished work of anti-colonialism, of anti-racism, of the physical dismantling of the white infrastructure that remain in our museums. It, it, actually, it turns out that the museums are crucial spaces for wider conversations about the ways in which empire is not over. And so restitution, as, as we've heard in, in all its forms, not only but certainly having to include the physical return of objects when asked. Um, but a wider set of, sort of reckonings of the beginning of accountability and sort of repair that we can see in terms of the reckoning with empire, that is something we can undertake in the museum in a very unique way. We can think of them as a public space where we can recognize that not only in the museum, but more widely in the university, more widely across society, there are ways in which empire is not over. Wow, that's very powerful. Last but not least, Felwyn. Okay, thank you, Tara, for, for bringing us together and for inviting me in this conversation. I want to start by saying that I totally agree with what Monica said at the beginning. Uh, for us, the question is obviously the return of the object, but more than that is the uh, the rethinking of all the knowledge that are embodied in the object once. The question of re-socializing the object when they arrive in African countries, which kind of status and function and how can we put them in touch with the contemporary question of African societies. You know, this object as an element of the rebuilding of the history, it's obvious, but of the psychic infrastructure that needs come to be healed. And all these questions around the archive are absolutely important. And I totally agree with this idea of regaining the agency of being the one who produced knowledge on these objects. It's, it's, it's absolutely fundamental. Even if in some African countries, objects are not objects. They are some subjects, you know, they have an, an identity, they operate in the real, in the reality, they are more than artifacts, they are not ethnographic objects, and their status is, is much more rich, complex than these uh, categories. So the question of the re semantizations of the object is absolutely important and, 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 no, and, no, and no fundamental one. The question of, you know, uh, the, I think, uh, European has the part to do with to, to deal with their own colonial history and how they produce alterity. You know, it's their own task. You know, you know, this part of decolonization is their part. They have to do it. African can't do it for them. But for African, I think it's absolutely important to be aware that in the legacy of colonialism. The question of object is not just about the object, it's deeper than that. You know, it's a question of decolonization, it's a question of history, it's a question of memory, it's a question of, of trace, it's a question of, of narrative, and it's the question of reinventing oneself by being able to build again upon the, these material traces. And I just want to say to Monica that, that she's right in the debate. We have a bit forgotten North Africa, Egypt, and, and she's absolutely right by saying that. In, in our report with Benedict Savoy, we, our argument was to say we are focusing on sub-Saharan African countries because the task was huge, first. And second, their specificity was that more than 80% of the objects were outside. And in a country like Egypt, there's a lot of artifacts from Egypt, you know, in, in Europe. But if you go in, in Le Caire, you have important museum and, and you have a significant amount of objects that are, you know, on the Egyptian soil. So it's why we decided to start by, you know, uh, sub-Saharan so, so African countries, but she's absolutely right. You know, the, the artifact of Egypt has been westernized, you know, in the imaginaries, and there is a lot to do in this question. So I want to leave it here. Thank you.
Um, the first question actually relates to a lot of what you were saying, Philene, about um, how Egypt's become westernized. And it's for you, Monica. It's about how can institutions combat the cultural appropriation of Egypt? So what would be next? Um, I think next uh, should be uh, the beginning of a discourse uh, between rather than state officials, it would, should be between academics and then taking it uh, to the public spaces on why do we need to repatriate? How, how do, the Egyptian, do the Egyptians feel about the Rosetta Stone being in the British Museum? How do the Egyptians feel about the Dendera Zodiac being in the Louvre? How do the Egyptians feel about their Queen Nefertiti in the Noyes Museum? And the other way around, how do the people of Berlin, Paris, and London feel about having such a uh, theft in the museums? And I think um, the, the discussion should be mutual between academics and the people. How, how, how do you feel about having these objects in the museum? And I think it starts also by telling the real story of how these objects arrived at these museums, which in many cases is really not part of the museological narrative. And I think uh, this whitewashing of the, the objects needs uh, to stop and uh, a different history for these objects uh, need to be written on how they've arrived, how the Dendera uh, uh, temple was bombed so that the French could carve out the Dendera Zodiac and keep it in the Louvre Museum, how the Rosetta Stone is a spoil of war and how the Nefertiti bust was uh, covered with mud and the smuggled outside of Egypt. And it, they say we took it officially, legally, but, but, but it's definitely not ethically. So how, how we can confront this um, on both the academic and the public spaces, how people can think about uh, such ethical implications and how also Egyptians would really understand uh, the, the ethical implications of these objects continuing to be uh, there. I think this is how we would start. And then we have to advocate free movement for objects. I think uh, objects should be allowed uh, to travel for loans and, and not just, I mean, the Louvre has kept the Dendera Zodiac with a huge Egyptian collection for years. How about also the Louvre does a temporary exhibition of Renaissance art in Cairo for, a, for an exchange of the objects that they have. So I think this is uh, how uh, such negotiations need to start. That's really powerful. Dan, do you have any thoughts about how museums can um, start that narrative? Yes, absolutely. So I think, I mean, in terms of uh, returns at the start, we need to start thinking exactly as we said, uh, as we heard, at the outset from Monica, this is a question over agency. So when returns are demanded, and it is in terms of, of uh, yeah, yeah, returns, it has to be a demand led uh, idea. You know, this isn't about sending back, it's about the giving back when asked, but it's also about sharing knowledge of what's in the collection so the demands are able to be made. So a part of this conversation that's often missed is how much of what we're talking about is not even on display. So we hear about those incredibly important objects, the famous ones like the Rosetta Stone. But if you look at Nigerian objects, which is what I've been working on recently, and the book I recently wrote about the example of the Benin objects, there, even in the British Museum, which has about 900 or so of the more than 10,000 objects that were looted in 1897, even of those you know, little over 900 objects, you know, only about 100 or so are actually on display. If you look across the UK, less than 1% of the objects taken from Africa under empire are, are even on display. And so many of them are sort of hidden away in, in spaces that you can't access and in boxes that haven't been opened in some cases for 100 years. So this is not purely about the removal of things from display. It's about the neglect and the facing up to the fact that we just thought as institutions that we could hide away these objects, hide away the human remains and ignore them. 
you know, we can't undertake that anymore. This is a moment for transparency. It's a moment for honesty. And it's about the rebuilding of those international relations and relations with the wider diasporas, you know, of the communities who we serve as institutions, from whom we gain, you know, wider, uh, you know, the ability to be legitimate sort of institutions, um, and who we have in the ongoing act of saying, no, we're not going to share information, we're going to keep the displays up, we have continued to keep out of, of these conversations. So I think, that if, I, if I may, because um, this is very important, one of the most enduring arguments that the apologists of the colonial museums made um, was to the effect that they, um, their raison d'etre was to keep and protect world cultures and world heritages um, and then share it with the rest of the world. What Dan is describing is in fact the very opposite of that. So rather than sharing of world heritages, they are hoarding them, right? And so when you think about museums like the Tavuren, right? Um, and hundreds of thousands of objects that they have mm -hmm. in that museum just from the Congo. Um, and so, of course, the Congo in the 1970s demanded for the re return of um, objects from there. They sent a few, you know, uh, scores of stuff, not even the, the most important things, and still kept the ten tens of thousands of objects in their vaults, right, away from the public. Perhaps some few researchers have had access to them over these many decades. So what we're talking about is if indeed these museums and institutions are really truly sincere about sharing of world heritage, then they should act like it, right? And not talk about it but do the very opposite of it. There's hardly a possibility for many citizens of these places from where these objects were taken to be able to travel to the Mets and the British museums and the uh, Berlin Ethnological Museums and so forth. They don't have the right passports to travel, right? And so when we think about and talk about sharing the world's heritages, what we need to do, in fact, is to think about multiple sites where the world heritage is, could be legitimately located. So that if we're talking about exchanges, then we can talk about really true exchanges rather than this very idea of locating these institutions in the West, protecting them with the power of nation states and still talk about universal institutions. And this is, of course, what we're seeing today in Britain, where the politicians are basically um, dampening the enthusiasm among scholars and uh, working in these museums about questions of restitution. That at the end of the day, the so-called universal museums are defended by the might of the still enduring uh, national powers in the West. That's really powerful. Um, the next question is for Felwyn. It's about, um, in your report on the restitution of looted art, you've mentioned, similar to the pa other panelists, that restitution unravels a system of appropriation and alienation. What place does restitution serve in the broader cultural decolonial movement, and what can other movements learn from it? Yes, I just want, to, before answering the question, to build on what uh, uh, Chika has said this idea of universal museum and this idea of displaying the cultural heritage of the global world, you know, in Western places. You know, in 2005, there were a, a declaration in the Faro that was uh, uh, saying that the European youth has the right to their patrimony, the droit, the droit au patrimoine. And, and given the situation of the, of the, of the inability to to a global mobility for African 
young people, they can travel, you know, as it, it has been said. Their cultural heritage is kept in hostage in Western Kabul Museum. How can we consider that the European youth, they have the right to their patrimony and the African youth didn't have the right, you know, to be if exposed and to see their, their real patrimony. And this kind of dichotomy in this idea of universality, universality is when the objects are displayed in, in Europe. But when they are displayed in Dakar, in, in, in Côte d'Ivoire, in Benin, they are not more universal. And it's that kind of to, to me with ownership and universality. An object is not because, you know, it's a patrimony of the, of the humanity that it doesn't come from a place, from a community, and doesn't have specific meaning for this community. You know, this kind of, you know, this way of abstracting object, you know, from their ecologies of meanings, of of original meanings by just emphasizing the abstract of the artifacts that is come to be seen by itself and produce its own sense, you know, and this sense is, is, is totally detached, you know, from the communities, from the ecologies, you know, you, you know taking the object and, and making them no longer re resonate with all the significations around. So I think it's important to deconstruct this discourse around universality that is hiding the you know the reality you, you can't imagine that all the repainting of the of the renaissance or in the french church in dakar and being and being and being held there you can't imagine that and the reverse is being it is naturalized you know and i think it's absolutely important this idea that during a century you were we were able to to go to a European museum to find artifacts from Egypt, from Ghana, from Benin, and it was normal because they have built a discourse around it, and we believe in that kind of discourse, and uh, you know, and 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 they naturalize the, the presence of these objects. I think the question of alienation is a vast one. Just to say that probably all this question around restitution is also a question around colonial common legacy that is actually having effects in the contemporary times. And I think people are much more interested in the idea of reinventing the, the, the relation and changing the terms of the relation. And changing the terms of the relation necessitates you know, a kind of inventories of how the relation was built and how we can unfold what is problematic in the economy of exchange. So, so I think obviously, he, History is, is absolutely important, but the desire of keeping this object, of maintaining the status quo, is also saying that there is a desire to maintain the nature of the relationships. And the relationship is not, you know, is not fair. It's not fair in, in, in different areas, in economy, you know, in, in in home politics, but it's not fair also in the, in the, in the narrative and the, and, the, and the production of knowledge, imaginaries and alterity. And, and, and one of the sides of this production is the museum or the way they are dealing you know, with this object. And you can be, you, you can inherit of object that you haven't stolen or, you know, or looted and you inherit from them. But your responsibility is to change in your contemporary time the nature of the economy of exchange you you, you, you can just say that it's my heritage and it's you are benefiting from an asymmetric power relation and how do you deal with this asymmetric power relation that is your heritage now and i think all the questions around racism sexual racism cultural superiority inequities in a global scale uh, can be fought through the way that a society decides to deal with a problematic aspect of his own heritage. For sure. Um, that brings me actually to my next question um, for Dan about how, speaking about the culture war and asymmetric power relations, focusing on protecting statues and protecting quote unquote heritage. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Of course, absolutely. So, yeah, um, I guess we are in a strange time at the moment where an increasingly sort of incoherent element of the current uh, government and some movements around them are seeking 
to argue that what we receive from the past has to be preserved in aspic. There's even listed building consent is somehow a matter for controversy when Oriel College in Oxford or the Church of England or whoever wish, or indeed a museum, actually wish to bring their institutions into step with their times. But it isn't out of nowhere that this comes. So I'd say if we think about environmentalism, if we think about the Robert McFarlane line, about it, as environmentalists, we have to be good ancestors for the people that, that are going to come for the future. To some degree in, in the museums and heritage world, we have to be good uh, descendants. We have to think hard about what we have, as we just heard enormously eloquently from Felwyn, actually what we have sort of received from the past. So the fallism movement and the restitution movement are long-standing African-led movements. The first objects were returned to Nigeria in terms of the Benin objects as early as 1938. And the, the, the if you like, the movements to remove statues erected under colonialism, you know, we see that in the 60s in Algeria, we saw it in uh, Cape Town in, in 2015. These are movements that have a long history. And the thing that unites them is an awareness that in quite a narrow, you know, you know historical amount of time between, let's say, the 1880s and the 1930s, there was a kind of a cultural supremacy, a white supremacy that sought to build its way of seeing the world into art and culture. So whether the Confederate statue that was erected opposite the courthouse in, in the towns of the American South, whether it was the image of Cecil Rhodes erected um, here, here in Oxford in 1912, or at Cape Town, or whether it was the Colston image, in, which was erected obviously a 17th century slaver, but erected in 1895. This was a period of time where racism in its modern sense, what Fanon calls not the vulgar racism, but the cultural racism, the use of culture in order to argue for supremacy, this was built into our external built environments, but or in terms of naming streets, images in, in the streets, but also into our museums. So the dismantling of that you know, propaganda, the dismantling of that needs uh, us to approach history, not as the historian his, historians have often sort of argued, according to loving the past, but allowing ourselves to say that, in, that there are some parts of the past that we do not wish to preserve, that we wish to allow ourselves to move on for, from. So yes, you know, there is on the right some attempt to whip up some you know, moral panic about this. I mean, very interestingly, the, the arguments over restitution have not really found them their, their way into the arguments because what you see with looted objects is something which is more generally true for all sorts of other institutions. So I think here in the UK, certainly, this is about waking up to a phase of our past in which certain forms of racism and exclusion are sort of, you know, if you, if you like, it's early fascism. It's the proto-fascist sort of movements of the early 20th century used culture in those ways. We, of course, have to allow ourselves to bring our towns and our institutions into step with our times and allow them to change. If, if, if anyone wants to respond or speak to that. Um. Sure, I'll, I'll, I should just say very briefly about the, the statues and monuments must fall. It just reminds me of, of Rome, right? What Rome did when it was the most powerful empire on the planet, right? The Caesars sent out their statues to represent them in the far reaches of empire with portraits of, of uh, the Roman emperors. And that was basically a question of 
establishing the symbolic presence of the Caesar in far out lands where the Roman army could not reach. So those statues perform the symbolic function of establishing the presence of the power that was then. And this is precisely what these statues did during the age of empire. It wasn't just the statue of Queen Victoria, it was also her agents, right? That were sent and established in various parts of, of the world. And so in demanding for the, um, you know, pulling down or removal of these objects, it's one small symbolic gesture of saying the times of colonialism are over, except if some people still are arguing that it is not. And this is how we see some of the far right response to this by turning it into culture war. What culture war, right? Who are the combatants in this war? if not the apologies of empire and the antagonists of empire. And people have to pick, their, pick and choose what side of this war that they belong in. Absolutely. And so it isn't a war if there's only one side. Ultimately, we're just doing, you know, I think I'm just doing my job right, as a curator. It's already restitution is business as usual in the case of Nazi, loot and the very different historical circumstances obviously there in terms of the rest of the return of ancestral remains human remains so why is it so different when it comes to african cultural objects on a case-by-case -case basis you know when they're wanted back that is not a culture war that's a, actually what's going on is an attack upon culture by the hard right and we need to push back we need our museum leaders we, we need the, uh, the generational change that's happening in our museums to be open to this. But we also need to foreground African voices in ensuring that it isn't purely performative. It's not just one object here and there. It, it, it isn't only the Benin bronzes, that there are other meaningful actions of repair that happen. But this is if we wake up to the fact that the taking of these objects was about anti black violence and the rhetoric of anti blackness, then, you know, I think that helps a lot in understanding how these things are under every day we open the doors, they're enacting hurt upon our audiences, our visitors, our wider communities, our stakeholders, but also the people that would never set foot in this museum because they know what it is and how hurt they would be if they walked inside. Not to mention the many Africans and others around the world who, as we've heard, because of the visa regimes are unable to do the Universalist Museum thing of just hop on an aeroplane to see your culture. So uh, time's up. For sure. To just go off that, um, the last individual question is for you, Chica. It's about, you speak spoken on repatriating artifacts with the hashtag Black Arts Matter. Could you speak a little bit more about the rationale and scholarship behind the hashtag? And what do you think the ultimate goal of the movement is? Well, I'm not sure about the scholarship because I just, uh, it's something that I'm still thinking through. Uh, but the point of uh, devising this Black Arts Matter BAM, B-A-M, that sounds nice. Um, but it's, it's really to connect the question of restitution to the broader political landscape within which we find the Black Lives Matter movement, which of course started in the United States by that you know, terrible sight of George Floyd being killed on the streets of America. But we know that the principle behind the Black Lives Matter was much more and is well beyond the single act of killing of one man. That it is a demand for a change in the scheme of things, in the histories and the social formations that have guaranteed the continuing oppression and suppression of certain uh, um, elements of the national, but of course, especially the global citizenry. And so the Black Lives Matter, as we very much saw throughout 2020, 
manifested itself differently in various parts of the world, even though they were instigated and catalyzed by the Black Lives Matter movement. That in various countries, they were addressing power relation issues that were pertinent to those locations. And so in thinking about uh, Black, uh, Black Arts Matter, it's simply to say that what the advocates of restitution are doing is that they are reckoning with the broader histories of unequal power relations that were built most especially during the capitalist imperialism of Western Europe. And for us to do our own job, for someone like me who is an art historian whose sphere of oppression is art and culture, how do I translate the lessons of the Black Lives Matter to the work that I do as a scholar and as a critic curator who is working in the field of art and culture. So it's really the pairing of this anti-colonial, anti-racist principle at the basis of the Black Lives Matter that I'm advocating for those of us who are working in art and culture today in every part of the world. If I may, I just want to add a, a sentence on what uh, Chika has said. In the African societies and in a lot of indigenous cosmologies, there is a co-constitution of the human bodies and the bodies of the object. And I think there is a, there's an analogy to make here how the human bodies are treated and how the bodies of the object are treated because objects are not just objects. And the gesture of, of captation and the gesture of alienation or of objectifying people when they were transforming people to slave, they objectify them. You know, I think there is here an imaginary that they can be linked. So, so if you think this co-constitution of the, of the two bodies, so what is happening in one area, it can be seen as a mirror of what is happening in another domain. Just that. That's definitely very powerful. Um, the next question actually is coming in um, and is open for anybody to answer. Um, it asks, how does one identify rightful owners with up to centuries of regime change? Is there a formula or way to make this easier that governments and museums can stick to in repatriation? And so maybe I can uh, take that initially, uh, simply because it's a part of my day job as a curator. Um, so there's a long established, you, you know, set of uh, policies and procedures in different nations, we have you know, NAGPRA in North America, which is which is the legal framework for the return of ancestral remains to uh, the, um, yeah, Native Amer Americans. Uh, here at Oxford University, we we adopted last uh, year a formal procedure and process for how to make a. a claim for a return and there are different examples around the world but in the 90s i have to just just actually you know you know under underline a point i made earlier which is that actually since the 90s the return of objects has been absolutely a normal part of what we do and so many of the arguments against restitution in in the context of african and other cultural objects that were taken under empire we heard those arguments in the case of holocaust spoliation and in the case of ancestral remains you'll you know, how do you make sure you give them back, back the right person uh, are they going to be visible to the public you yeah, know what if they get sold all of those arguments were one by one shown to be absolutely. you know absolutely vacuous we know how to do this and and there is a professional practice evolving here so it's very straightforward um and it's importantly not only about nation states there are non-state actors here as well mm -hmm. so a big part of restitution of course is about the relationship of the formerly colonized nation to the formerly colonizing nation and those restitutions we're seeing in the French context, we're seeing the Dutch have, and the, um, have now said they're going to return. In those contexts, we're seeing actually the Germans are in Nigeria as we speak, having conversations about returning the Benin bronzes. Um, but there's a whole, whole host of non-state actors as well, both in Africa and elsewhere in the world. 
and also in Europe. I mean, the uh, the Pitt Rivers at, uh, at the University of Oxford. We are not a nation state. We we are another actor. So, in order just to take an example near to home for you in Cambridge University. The decision to return the Benin objects in the University of Cambridge's collection would be a decision for the trustees of the university. Uh, there's no uh, doubt that, that, that uh, demands have been made over the years. So the question now is for the stakeholders, the audiences and those listening to this conversation to start a, an engaged conversation with you know, your colleagues, with the institutions you love in order to help them evolve and to open up to restitution in a new set of ways. I think, Monica, you had your hand up for quite a while. Yeah, um, I'm also interested in exploring this point because um, I hear a lot about a criticism in terms of cultural continuity, that we only repatriate for cultures who actually have a relationship with their past. So you get... Uh, uh, even uh, museum directors like in Germany who would say, well, modern Egyptians are either Muslim or Christian, so they no longer pray to Ra or Aten, so why should we repatriate back these objects? And I think this is really a faux pas because, I mean, none, none is Europe. <laughs> Europe does not have a cultural continuity to these objects. And I think this idea of having this discontinuity pretext and uh, I think it's, 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 it has to do a lot with that most of the early archeologists who came to Egypt and to the region did not speak the languages of the region. They had no idea about the cultural continuity that still exists with many of the past cultures. And I think this inaccessibility to the modern peoples and thinking that such ancient cultures died in Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, and so on, Sudan, is actually um, a very big academic uh, uh, fault because they, they, they had no access to the modern anthropological documentation tools. So they absolutely had no idea and they continue to propagate such um, claims that uh, modern Egyptians uh, or the modern Libyans or the modern Moroccans, they absolutely, or the Sudanese, they have uh, no relationship to the past. So I think it, the, the discussion needs to also completely not think about this idea of that uh, uh, the culture must be a, a living culture or a continuous culture or I think it's it it it, it hurts uh, both sides actually because it shows how early uh, imperialists and colonialist academics who came to the region um, did not uh, even study the people it, it shows um, an academic uh, misachievement on the side as well. Uh, and uh, it also uh, takes away a lot of the living heritage from uh, the modern cultures of Africa. That's very powerful. Um, Bowie? Yes, I want to, 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 to jump on this question. It's, it's been an argument that, I've, that, that Benedict Savo and I heard heard a lot, you know, during the dismissal of restitution of African artifacts, the one of cultural continuity, and I think Monica has, has very well answered, the one of cultural continuity of the territoriality and nation states. These objects were taken in the Abomey Empire, now the Abomey Empire has disappeared. To whom are we going to, to restrict them? So after the Abomey Empire, you have the Benin Republic that is in the same geography that than the Abomey Empire. So you go to the Benin Republic, like in Europe, you have the Austrian, Hungarian, empire that disappeared and you have Germany, Austria and different countries that are now, you know, the in, in the heritage of this historical social formation is the same story. So, 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 so you can trace between Senegal, Guinea and Mali, actually where are the new communities that own these objects. So it's not a very, so it's a very false argument. And it's also interesting to think beyond the nation states. In African countries, you have cultural continuity that are cross borders. You can find a cultural community that, that some part are in Senegal, some are in Mali and in Guinea. And the circulation of these objects in this geography is a kind of reconstitution of pre-colonial geographies and cultural geographies. And it's very interesting to be able through the object to go beyond the borders of, of colonialism and to, and to deal in a space where 
uh, these objects have meaning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I just want to give an, an example in the Senegal when they restituted the sword of El Hadji to Omar Tal. El Hadji Omar Tal was a Sufi resistant to the French colonialism, and he was between Mali, Guinea, and Senegal. And when the sword, but the spiritual center of the community of 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 El Hadji Omar Tal is in Senegal, and every year they organize a gathering, and 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 people came from. Guinea, Mali, even if Nigeria, to, to meet in Senegal. So the SWAT arrived, uh, the, the French prime minister gave it to the president of Senegal. So I was in the room. The president of Senegal take the sword and give it to the from a family of El Omar. And the family of El Omar take the sword and give it to the director of the Museum of Black Civilization. So it was very interesting. The state is restituting to the state, the state give it to the family that, that was claiming the object, and the family give the object to, to the museum to host the object. So, so it's an example that, that there are a lot of solutions that can be found in this idea of, are we giving back to a community? Are we giving back to a state? Are we giving back to some private actors? You know, there are a lot of possibilities that exist. Um, yes. Can I just recap on this quickly? I think also the whole idea of that the Western museums need to disown the colonial heritage. And then the second part would be repatriating it to the different culture. I mean, they can continue even staying in the museums, but the museums need to ethically and legally disown such uh, objects Absolutely. before the repatriation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so th th let me just reemphasize the point that Dan made earlier. Uh, precisely because of its implication for U.S. museums. F for the longest time, uh, restitution and repatriation was Europe's problem as far as the American institutions were, right? because they did not colonize African countries and, and so forth. The point is this, that Germany did not loot Benin, mm -hmm. right? It was the British Navy. But Germany is returning its Benin objects today. Mm -hmm. So what is the argument that American museums can have? If not, and this is really the point, that the trustees of these museums are still resistant to the idea of restitution. And therefore, the work to be done going forward is to lobby, is to engage with whatever um, critical means that are uh, available and necessary to both educate and debate these questions with these uh, trustees of these museums. And for institutions like the ones in Britain, in Germany, and so forth, to lobby the politicians. If the decisions about restitution is in the hands of the politicians, then the workers in the culture industry who are involved and invested in restitution ought to find ways of reaching the political class and encourage and engage with them so that they make the the decisions that need to be made. For instance, the case of France, they have to change the inalienability laws for French governmental museums to be able to restitute. So for us as scholars and as activists and so forth, we have to be able to reach the decision makers, whether it's the trustees in the case of private museums or the politicians in the case of government museums. Otherwise, we can all agree among ourselves you know, as curators and critics and so forth, and yet the people that actually have to sign off on the real acts of restitution will still not be able to uh, be part of that conversation. So that is the next step of the debates, the engagement that must be uh, begin to happen for, you know, actualization of restitution and repatriation to happen. One last comment from Fawin, and then we'll move on to a question that's been submitted by a student. Yes, I want to jump on the question of the inalienability of the law in France. Uh, in the report, we have 
written a law that could change the actual law. We have did it, we've done it with 27 jurists, specialists of law that have already worked on restitution of the, the human remains of the Maoris of the, of the stolen uh, object from Monazism of different types of, of restitutions. And they provide us a framework that could change a specific section on the French law with a lot of arguments that saying, okay, you want to preserve your, 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 your national patrimony, but these objects were integrated in your national human patrimony in a, on a wrong basis. So you can put them out continue preserving your national you know, patrimony and being able to, to, to restitute them. They have wrote a specific law to restitute 26 objects of mm -hmm. artifacts of, of the Republic of Benin, one sword in Senegal for Amara and some objects for, for Madagascar. When they were debating to vote this law, they have said in the French parliament, look, we are starting with a specific law and we will observe observe what is happening, but we are open later to a general frame, a more general framework. And it will depend on how this first restitution will go. And what was interesting is just after this law, seven African, West African countries claim more than 10,000 objects. So, so it was for us very interesting to, to see this dynamic. From the independence to nowadays, a lot of African countries claim their object, but they were, they were discouraged by the response of France. And the Benin Republic keep continue claiming, and from their claim, Emmanuel Macron had this speech in Ouagadougou in 2017, and and this mission of, of restitution that Benedict and I did. But, but but what I'm witnessing now is that there is a lot of claims that are arriving, and they will not be able to vote for each claim a specific law. They will be obliged to go to a more general framework. And, and, and it's interesting to see this dynamic of the first restitution, you know, encouraging African countries to claim a lot of objects and, and, and putting them in a situation where they have to think a general framework that they don't want to think. But what is interesting to observe is that there, there is a resistance. The sense I have is that they are just leaving or giving what is, you know, what you take from them, you know. They're not deciding you know, genuinely, generously to say, okay, we are going to do the right move. You know, they, they just give a little, and if they see that to, 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 there is a strong dynamic, okay, they open a new door. It's mean that there is, a, you know, an, an imaginary that they have to heal, that they are not healing, you know. And, and the example of Germany is very interesting. They, they, they haven't looted this object, but they decide that they are going to restitute them, you know, and, 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 and they decide it by, also coordinating a lot of German museum to move together. So it's mean that there's something to be done probably in the civil space on their relation with this country and on their own history. But I feel that it's a question of time. They will not be able to resist in the long term if there is a lot of activism, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Um, the question that's just come in from Dan says, even though it's in principle, it might seem right to return all artifacts acquired by dubious means in their countries of origin. In practice, this is not always the case because said country is politically unstable and or incapable at present of properly maintaining them. Think of what the Taliban did to Buddhist statues in Afghanistan, for instance. What does this panel think about cases such as artifacts, even if demanded back by the governments of st such states? should be kept in Western institutions for safekeeping until states are politically stable. What would this panel do in that situation? Well, I wonder whether I can uh, jump in there. Obviously the long answer to this is to be found in the, uh, the new book by uh, Benedict Savoir, uh, which is called Africa's Camp um Seine Kunst, Africa's Struggle for Her Art, where she shows since 1960 and the Year of Africa, where 17 African nations got independence, that these myths that we just heard in the question were created. A set of rather partial legal restrictions were also created as the French and the British and the Germans and others worked together to try to push back against the demands by the newly independent African nations for returns. So my book underlines how everything we've just heard, instability, war, the sale of objects and so on, 
happened to the Benin bronzes in UK museums over the course of the 20th century. Museums, even the British Museum, are sold off objects mm -hmm. from the collections, from the Benin collections. There were museums, whole museums, that were shut down and sold off on the open market. Even war, there were examples with the bombing of, of the Liverpool Museum and whole, whole museum, they were bombed in the Blitz and the Benin bronzes and so many other African and international world culture objects were destroyed in war. These are not only the problems for African institutions, they're problems for European institutions as well. Combine that with how little we understand of what's in the stores, how little we even know of what we hold, and every one, every single piece of the house of cards that has been created to make the argument that Africans and other people around the world are less capable inherently of looking after their own culture simply falls apart. Uh, yes, I want to add quickly. Yes, I want to add quickly to the arguments of of Dan that are very strong. That uh, the Louvre in the Louvre, uh, Benedict and I did the research because we we've been opposed this kind of argument and a lot of object to disappear, you know, from the Louvre. And if you count them, you know, it's uh, it's very important and very and very significant. But I think what is problematic in his argument is to say that the responsibility of safeguarding these objects is the one of the European one, you know, to taking the responsibility. It's a universal patrimony and we have to take care of the preservation. It's the idea of conservation. You know, in a lot of African countries, the idea of, of eternity of object is not their idea. The objects have a lifespan. They, they have their birth, they grow and they die and they rebirth and they grow and they die again. And some African community, when they have masks, they, after 10 years, they bury the mask to renew the energetic influx. So this idea of an object that is an immortal object is in the Western cosmology, it's not in the African cosmology. The, the objects are, are as human beings and they have a lifespan. So I think there, there's an epistemological problem of the monumentality and the eternity of the object. Second one, even if Africans want to take back them object and burn them and burn them, it's their right, you know. So, 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 so the people who is who have stole your car or your object don't have the moral ability to say to you how do you have to deal with your own compassion. Even if you want to make it to disappear and renew it because it's your belief, you have the authority and the right to do it. It's not from them to decide how. Are we going to deal with the question of preservation and conservation, et cetera, et cetera? It's not their, you know, it's not their question. And I think it's important to, to trace this idea that, oh, we, we are the responsible of, of preserving this object, even if it's, it's not the question. Let me just uh, make this comment. Mm -hmm. The Benin bronzes were in the palace for two centuries. On for hundreds of years yes. in that palace yes. until the British right. looted them in 1897 mm. and many have been lost since. Mm. In England, as Dan mentioned, the Liverpool Museum was bombed out of, out of existence, right? So the argument that the Africans naturally, because that's the implication, can't take care of what they value is simply part of the colonial racist argument about the inability of other people to um, organize their lives and cultures uh, in ways that they deem fit. And as Felwyn just said, who gives Europe the right to determine for other people what is important to them, what is valuable to them? We do know that these objects are valuable because Africans are asking for them. The Egyptians are asking for, for their objects, right? They know that it's important to them. We've seen one instance where some artists went and made a Nefertiti sculpture somewhere in, in, in Egypt as if that would stand in place of the, uh, the real object in the Noyes Museum. And the community there said, no way. We know where the real Nefertiti is. It is still in Germany. 
this object that they made in their community will not replace what they consider as the representation of Nefertiti. So there are not any logical, moral, ethical position to make such this, you know, comment about Africans' uh, inability to safeguard you know, their cultural patrimony. Um, I think also that the security situation in many of the European museums, I mean, is not at its best. I know what happened at uh, Berlin last year where many statues, including Egyptian artifacts, were covered with wax. Uh, many museums in Germany last year were, uh, had thefts, had, uh, were looted. So this, this actually happens in Europe. And even fire. Uh, some uh, museums had the unfortunate uh, fires that destroyed objects of other cultures. So again, this idea that uh, museums in the West are in this safe haven actually does not exist. And the same what endangers objects here endangers objects there. And if we compare about the security situation and what happened in the Capitol in Washington, D.C., I don't think there would be really much difference. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of our panelists. If you all could just give a very, very brief closing remark to finish off this discussion, that would be great in any order you'd like. Mary Jim, just to say thank you, and I'm very happy of this conversation and, and all the arguments. And I, I was just remembering that two or three years later, Benedict and I, uh, in the battle, in the heart of the battle, we sometimes feel alone, you know, because all these bad arguments were surrounding us, you know, and we had to fight you know, on every stage, every, you know, every newspaper against all this set of argument. And two years later, I had the sense that the, the debate is more spread and there's a lot of, you know, strong people than X, you all that are, you know, building a strong case and it's no longer, it's not possible to keep the, the narratives. And I think the emancipation start there first, you know, how the, the intelligibility of the questions and move to the activist place and to the political space, but being able to, to re-narrate and to rethink the question is an absolute fundamental step. And I'm very happy that it's being done, you know, in the, in the different places. If I can just add to that, uh, Felwyn, we're absolutely uh, shoulder to shoulder with uh, you and uh, Benedict. It is wonderful to be a part of this international conversation with, with, with so many, you know, not only the people on the panel there today, along whom it's an honour to be talking, but so many across Africa, across America, across uh, 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 Europe and around the world. It feels that there's a generational shift hap happening in this conversation. It feels like arguing with the past sometimes here. But I just want to make one, one point really to finish from my perspective, which is let's hold on to that sense that this is about addressing anti-Black violence and its memorialization for the purposes of you know, cultural supremacy, white supremacy. So when the verdict came on the racist killing of, of uh, George Floyd, mm -hmm. the Minnesota Attorney General made, I think, a very important observation. He said, I would not call today's verdict a justice because justice implies true restoration, but it is accountability, which is a first step towards justice. So for us in museums, from a European perspective, sharing the knowledge, being accountable, the sense that the British were famous for burning the documents of empire, but they didn't burn the objects in museums or the accession registers. We have unique indexes of the history of imperial violence and of dispossession, of the removal of sovereignty, of the willful destruction of traditional religion. It's up to us to face, to find our way towards that accountability so let's hope for another generation ahead in the coming years, we can get something towards repair and justice and some sort of a reconciliation. After this war, which, we, which in so many ways was what empire was. Um, so let me just say that 
in the work at present and in the near future that we cannot underestimate the power of uh, a resistance by uh, you know, sections of humanity that want to hold on to the past, the past in which they see themselves as the lords of the planet and therefore the arbiters of culture. We cannot underestimate their willingness to push back against the work uh, that is being done today that was so very well um, articulated by the Black Lives Matter movement of last year. And we are seeing already how much pushback we're, we're, we're experiencing, whether it's in the new polities that are emerging um, across Europe and America, uh, in resistance to the entrance of the others, right, in the public space of politics and debate. We cannot underestimate the impact that these forms of resistance um, uh, can have on the work of art and culture um, to the extent that activists, scholars who are invested in uh, decolonizing the academy, the museum, the art institutions of the world, that it will not be easy and we cannot relent and must devise new means of pressing these issues and keeping them in the front burner. Otherwise, there are enough forces to make them get cold and we cannot afford to do that until the complete decolonization of art and cultural institutions um, is made complete. Um, the last point I'd like to make is that the restitution of artifacts also supports the financial stability of many of the countries. Because if you think uh, of the money uh, that many museums have been making because of having such art and such heritage in their premises, and when this is restituted, it could also um, create new uh, job opportunities, new development, um, and new uh, peaceful relations uh, with, diff with other communities within the African continent. And I think that um, restitution, again, is, is um, a philosophy rather than uh, bringing the objects back to their home, Absolutely. because it's, again, about restituting the agency to the continent in creating the knowledge about its past. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all so, so much um, to all of our panelists. It was a really great um, and fulfilling discussion. Um, and we are so, so glad to have all of you in this virtual format, to have you all in the same virtual room. Just a reminder um, for everybody watching about the bumper crop of events we have coming up this week. Later tonight, we have Anna Park, the South Korean ambassador to the UK on at seven. On Tuesday, we have our first in-person event of the term with Joel Domit at 6 p.m. Reminder that this is open to all and please turn up to Hewitt around 5.30 to avoid disappointment. At 3 p.m. on Wednesday, we have our Democracy in America panel online. And then on Wednesday at 7, we have our Love Island panel, um, which is in person. So please make sure to turn up to that. On Thursday, we have a conversation with Lawrence Bacow and Stephen Toop from Cambridge to Cambridge. And later on on Thursday, we have our very first in-person debate of 2021 on the motion, this house would break up big tech. You can find the audition form on our Facebook and in the email that was sent out to members. And this debate will also be open to all. On Friday, we have two events, first being Lady Leisure at 4 p.m. and the second being an in-conversation with event with Ian Dale and Roger Mosey. Finishing off the week, on Saturday, we have our virtual male gaze in media panel. Thank you so, so much um, to all of our panelists and thank you so much to everybody watching. Have a great rest of the evening and greetings from the Virtual Cambridge Union. <laughs>